Hey everyone, my name is Christy. Welcome to my office. Thank you so much for joining me today on this Friday to talk about medieval bestiaries. And I've brought medieval bestiaries up a couple times and I just thought I would, you know, in my floss tubes and in my stitching, and I thought I would just give you a quick introduction to what they are, other animals that might be in them, why people use them, why people wrote them, kind of what they looked like, just for fun. Because <laughs> I love them, that's why. But before we get to that, I want to welcome my new subscribers. Thank you so much for joining me on my crafty and artistic adventures. And welcome back to everyone who has been hanging out with me for however long you've been with me. It's been great to get to know you in the comments here on YouTube and also on Instagram. And if you're not following me on Instagram, you can find me at Dr. Underscore Christy. And that's where I post pictures of my everyday life, my stitching, my neighborhood, my adventures, my other crafty things that I do, my dog, that kind of thing. So if you're interested in seeing what I'm up to during the week, you can find me at Dr. Underscore Christy. This is a channel about embroidery and cross stitch and other textile crafts and baking and history and the history of all of those things. So if any of that is interesting to you and you're not subscribed, I'd love to have you subscribe and stick around. So yeah, today I want to talk about medieval bestiaries. And those of you who watch my floss tube should recognize this picture. This is a image from the British Library Harley Manuscript 3488, which is a bestiary. And this is an image about bees, which I'll talk about in a moment. And the reason why it may seem familiar to some of you is because I recently stitched this in freehand surface embroidery. I don't have the piece with me right now, but um, I'll post a picture right here and so you can see the differences and similarities. I was really excited about this embroidery piece because it was the first time that I stitched on two different fabrics to get that red and white background without, you know, having to stitch the whole thing. So since I have been mentioning, and since you've been seeing my bees and my bear in my floss tubes for several months, I thought that I would just talk about that image and also other images that are uh, similar and from other animals. But first, I want to talk about what is a bestiary? And this is both a very easy question and also a difficult question. So the easy and short answer is that a bestiary is a book of animals, beasts, right? And these animals included real and not real animals. Medieval Europeans talked about the animals around them that they saw every day, like dogs in this picture, cats, mice, eagles, wolves, cows, horses, all those different things. But they also talked about other animals like dragons and unicorns and griffins and uh, phoenixes and stuff like that. So these animals were, in our mind, both real and imaginary. But for them, they were all very much real. They also sometimes talked about rocks and, uh, and plants. The bestiary was kind of a... I wouldn't say an encyclopedia, but it was definitely a collection of different stories about the world around them and what they could expect to find in the world around them. And when it described the animals, it would describe what they ate, their enemies, how you hunt them, how they can be used um, medicinally or for food or whatever, who their enemies were, that kind of thing. And they were a little bit obsessed with procreation, like how animals procreated, which you'll see in a moment. Bestiaries in medieval Europe were based on a second century Greek text called the Physiologus, which had a, a small smattering of animals, rocks, and plants, like later bestiaries, and they imbued these animals, rocks, and plants with Christian meaning, with Christian allegory, right? To sort of fit these different parts of creation into the wider creation, into the wider God's plan. And as kind of representations of God's plan. And later, this Greek text was combined with information from a book called Etymologies by Isidore of Seville. And Isidore of Seville was the Archbishop of Seville in the sixth and seven, in the late 6th, early 7th century. And this was between the fall of Rome and the fall of the Visigothic kingdom by the Muslims in the 8th century. Isidore of Seville is kind of this spot, is, is 
is a standout person in that time and place. And he wrote a book called, called Etymologies. And etymologies are the history of words, right? And the meaning of words and where those words came from. So he wrote this book, Etymologies, and it was essentially a encyclopedia of the universe. And he took as much information as he could possibly find about the universe and wrote it down. And he based his information off of hearsay. He did not leave Seville. He did not travel the world. He got his information from trusted sources who came to him. Now, Isidore of Seville's Etymologies was a bestseller throughout the Middle Ages, and a lot of the information that medieval Europeans had about the world came from Isidore's Etymologies. I will post a link to a PDF version of Isidore's Etymologies down below. You can read it, and it's really interesting. I have my students read it fairly regularly, just because it gives you an idea of how medieval people viewed the world. Let's talk about what he said about animals, because he has a whole section on animals. So he talks about horses, which in Latin is equus. And he says, horses, equus, are so called because when they were yoked in a team of four, they were balanced. Those equal in size and alike in gait would be joined together. Now he sees the etymology of equus coming from Iquere. Isidore of Seville is almost always wrong. <laughs> he was essentially trying to explain the world through language which is not always true. So just keep that in mind when I tell you these things. I don't know about the truth of Equus coming from Iquare in particular, but Isidore Seville was usually wrong <laughs> in some way. So this is what he says about horses. But then he kind of says some wacky things too. So we're, he talks about beavers, right? Like the beavers that make dams. And he says, beavers, castor, are so called from castrating castrare. Their testicles are useful for medicines on account of which when they anticipate a hunter, they castrate themselves and amputate their own genitals with their teeth. <laughs> so this kind of information Isidore of Seville got from multiple places. He got it from this earlier book, Physiologus, and he got it from people like Pliny the Elder, who was a Roman author and statesman who wrote something called Natural Histories. They were also often wrong. <laughs> Basically what happened in these bestiaries is that later authors would essentially take the ideas from Physiologus and ideas from Isidore of Seville and combine them into these amazing books. They are also highly, highly illustrated. So the nice thing about a bestiary and why they're so much fun is that bestiaries have lots of pictures, as you can see in the different kind of backgrounds that I'm showing you here. Almost all bestiaries are illuminated and earlier bestiaries are much less elaborately illuminated. They may just be, you know, pen strokes or pencil strokes, no color, but later bestiaries and ones that were made for the nobility were highly illustrated often gilded, and were really quite beautiful, actually. So that's one of the cool things about a bestiary is that you know you're gonna get pretty pictures of really weird animals, <laughs> or weird interpretations of animals, as you'll see. And bestiaries are organized in ways that tell a story. And that's what kind of sets best medieval European bestiaries apart from the physiologist, is that the physiologist was kind of a random there doesn't seem to be any particular organization to that text. Whereas a bestiary tells us a story of creation. And the story is the power of the Christian God and his rational organization of the world. What this means is that most animals have a deeper meaning and significance. And if you look at animals, which is God's creation, you can understand more about the human relationship with the Christian religion, with Christ, with each other. Bestiaries are not just pretty pictures of animals. They're also a moral teaching device for understanding the world around them and understanding how people should behave. So let's talk about some of these animals because that's the fun part, right? The fun part is learning about the animals, learning how weird they are, and thinking about how people related to these animals. 
So the first one I want to talk about is this picture that you've seen before of the bees. They thought that bees were tiny birds. So in bestiaries, bees are included with birds. They believe that they were born out of decaying oxen flesh. And not all bestiaries are the same. I will put a link down below to the Aberdeen bestiary, which you can see in full color and it is transcribed and translated into English. And there's a lot of really neat stuff in there. So what you learn in the Aberdeen bestiary is that bees were born out of decaying oxen flesh, only oxen. So if a bee came out of like a mule, it was a wasp. They were very particular that a honeybee comes out of oxen and honeybees are what you want because honeybees make honey and you know, we appreciate that. So they're born out of decaying flesh. They believe that they were ruled by a king. And this may be because it was difficult to think about a female sort of matriarchy, right? A female uh, ruling this entire system of, of bees. So although beekeepers understood, I think for quite a long time, that the queen bee was a queen, the people who were using bees as allegories saw them as a king. And, and, and he was like the perfect king. Bees were used as an allegory for an ordered society. And so they would do their jobs, they would obey the rules, they would do what they were supposed to do in order for the, you know, the unity of the whole. In the Aberdeen bestiary, there are multiple pages dedicated to bees. And he refers to the beehives, or the, the author refers to the beehives as castles. And these warrior bees and king bees and night and, and drone bees are all doing their appropriate jobs and they're happy in their appropriate jobs and they're doing it for the love of their king. And for the upper classes, this was a very attractive model for society. And you may be looking at this picture and thinking, well, how do you know that this is a picture about bees? Why isn't this a picture about bears? Because bears had their own picture and bears were often depicted in this way where you have a mother bear and a lump of something with eyes and a snout-like thing. And this is how bears were depicted because the idea was that bears gave birth to like lumps of flesh as cubs, like the cubs had no form. And so the mother bear had to lick the form into the lump of cub flesh that she gave birth to. So almost all bears in medieval bestiaries are the mother bear licking a lump of brown, <laughs> essentially, uh, in order to lick it into shape, essentially. And someone, there's, I read somewhere that this is where you get the term lick, lick something into shape, but I'm not sure that that is true. And I didn't look it up, so I'm not saying that it's true. <laughs> but she is literally licking her cub into shape. When we talked about Isidore of Seville, I mentioned beavers. So let's talk about beavers. Here is a picture of some beavers and hunters. And you can see the hunter closest to the beaver already has his prize of beaver testicles. Beaver testicles were medicinal. And I don't know what kind of medicine they were making, but this is not uncommon that you would use different parts of animals uh, as medicine. And you can see the the beaver in the back is missing <laughs> his testicles and the beaver in the front is sacrificing his testicles so the hunters don't kill him. So this was a kind of surprising view of beavers and allegorically it means that a holy person will, in order to live chastely and in the virtues will sacrifice the vices and the devil will stop hunting. So essentially what this is saying is that the devil is the hunters and Christian people are the beavers and the testicles are vices. And if you throw your vices at the devil, he will stop hunting you. <laughs> so that's, that's where the beaver comes in. And I find that, I don't know, I, they're just so sad. Uh, you can't see the one in the back because of the text, but he's he's unhappy. <laughs> so that's beavers. 
One animal that gets a lot of space in bestiaries is the elephant. And I think elephants fascinated medieval people because most medieval Europeans had never seen an elephant, but elephants feature prominently in legendary stories. So Alexander the Great was a legendary figure in medieval Europe and would end up in a lot of different stories. And he was gifted elephants. And so like elephants show up in that. In stories about the Roman Empire, elephants show up. So they understood what elephants were, they understood where elephants were, but they had never seen them. And so elephants sometimes, as you'll see at the end, look pretty funny. But what do elephants mean? And, and like I said, elephants take up a lot, a large space. So elephants were really cool because uh, they were used in warfare. And so in the picture that's in the back right now, you, you can see that they believe they put castles on top of the elephant and they would kind of fight in that way. But then it gets kind of weird because the understanding of elephants and the allegory of elephants was very connected. To a male and female elephant together represented Adam and Eve. According to this idea of elephants, the elephant requires to eat mandrake root to conceive. Mandrake root is a root of a plant and the root looks like a human. And so when you, and when you pull out the mandrake root, it, the mandrake root screams. Um, this has been depicted in um, Harry Potter, it's been depicted in Pan's Labyrinth, right? This is a, a long-standing idea of the mandrake root. The mandrake root is viewed as evil. And so the elephant takes, the female elephant takes the mandrake root, eats it, and then gives it to the male elephant to eat. And this then represents Eve picking the apple, giving it to Adam to eat. And then they conceive, um, just like in Adam and Eve, in Genesis, they are cursed with reproduction, essentially. Uh, painful reproduction when they're kicked out of, of heaven. This picture that I'm showing you here, you can see you have the two elephants and you have over here Adam and Eve being told not to eat the apple by God and them later disobeying. And this is all kind of going together with the elephants. Kind of physical and also representational view of elephants. Another physical and representational view of elephants is that they have no knees. And so if they fall over, they can't get back up. And the idea was that so here in this picture, you have a, the little, the red elephant has fallen over and all these other large elephants can't help him get up. And there are always 12 large elephants that come and try to help him up and can't help him up. And the 13th elephant is a small elephant, which is this blue elephant here, or this kind of grayish blue elephant. And the small elephant can help him up. And this represents people who have sinned, they fall over, the 12 apostles come and try to help them up, but they can't help them up or they can't resurrect them. And then the small elephant is Jesus because he is small because he's humble. And so Jesus can come and help this elephant up. That's how this fits into this kind of Christian theology. But this picture is also awesome because they look amazing. Like these look like amazing elephants and I love them. And I love their like little horn trunks. I love their horn trunks. And then finally, elephants are the enemy of dragons. So uh, elephants are the largest land animal. Dragons are the largest animal, according to medieval views of animals. Therefore, the only animal that could defeat elephants were dragons. And so here we have a dragon attacking an elephant. And again, love the elephant, right? It's got like a beak and little tiny ears. Um, it's blue, <laughs> although the color doesn't necessarily indicate that they thought they were blue. Um, and we'll talk about dragons later, but you see this dragon is trying to constrict the elephant uh, with its tail. So I love this depiction of an elephant, but there are like more, like, I mean, this guy, you can tell he's an elephant, but there's something really weird happening, right? And then we have this guy where we have like this saddest little elephant being attacked by a giant dragon. This is elephants and they have a large place. They have a lot of allegory connected to them and they take up a lot of space in the bestiary, the Aberdeen bestiary anyway. Those are the real animals that I wanted to talk about. But now I want to talk about a couple of 
imaginary animals that they viewed as real. The first one I want to talk about is the phoenix. The phoenix was really interesting because the mythology surrounding the phoenix actually had real world implications, which I'll talk about in a moment. So the, the idea of the phoenix is that it gathers frankincense into a nest um, and then it sets fire to the nest and burns itself to death, right? That's, uh, and in some bestiaries, it does this every 500 years. In some bestiaries, there can only ever be one phoenix. And this is this varies in different in different books. But the neat thing about this is that mythology like this caused people to think that spices like frankincense were difficult to get. The idea was that you had to get frankincense from the nests of phoenixes. And that's dangerous, <laughs> right? or other birds, right? Other, you had to sort of get the spices from the nests of birds, of these sort of dangerous birds. And because people believed that, you could charge more for your spices. So these mythologies aren't just theoretical. They also had real world, real world implications. So after the phoenix burned to death, in the ashes came a tiny little worm on the first day. And on the second day, that worm turned into a tiny little chick. And by the third day, you had a full-grown phoenix who flew off back to his nest to sort of start the process over again. And this, of course, represents Jesus' resurrection. He died and he rose on the third day. So that's where phoenixes fit into this theology. And I also love that sometimes the phoenix looks like he's on a grill. <laughs> like he's grilling himself. So that's why I included this. I just find that really funny. So he takes his spices and then he grills himself. I don't know how delicious a phoenix would taste. Just saying. We just had a representation of Jesus. And so I want to end with the dragon. And the dragon, of course, represents the devil. The dragon kill things with its tail. Like I said earlier with the elephant, he constricts. He uses his tail to constrict. And in fact, almost all the bestiaries talk about the dragon as being much more dangerous from behind than from the front. Although in some cases they can breathe fire. And in the case of this image here, he's eating a dove. And he attacks elephants and doves. And this makes sense theologically, allegorically, right? He attacks elephants who in many, many ways represent people. The way that the dragon attacks elephants is that it waits in hiding while the elephants are walking by and jumps out and attacks them in the same way that as people are moving through their life, the devil sends sin and temptation un unexpectedly in their path and they have to like fight the dragon, right? And doves represent peace and they represent the Holy Spirit, right? And so the dragon is attacking this peace and love, the devil is attacking peace and love, that kind of a thing. But the dragon, the only thing that can kill a dragon is a panther. And the panther represents Jesus. Essentially, the, pa the panther attracts people to it, has a very sweet smell, in the same way that Jesus brings the world together. And so panthers represent Jesus and are able to defeat the dragon just like Jesus is able to defeat the devil. There are lots of other animals and plants and stones in the, in the bestiaries. I'll put a link down below to Isidore of Seville's Etymologies. I'll put a link to the Aberdeen Bestiary. And then I'll also put a link to a website that is kind of a database of bestiaries and bestiary images. And there are some great ones in there. So I hope this piqued your interest and you take a look at those different sources. I hope you enjoyed the video and learning more about bestiaries and more about how medieval people, medieval Europeans viewed animals and the world around them, um, and also how they kind of related to the world around them. I think that that's a really important part of bestiaries. But I'm going to leave it at that. I want to thank you all for joining me. I will see you next Friday for my floss tube. And with all that being said, please take good care of yourselves and have a good one. Bye. Okay.